Good afternoon, everybody. Judy Maggio with KLRU's Decibel, and I'm here with a very important member of the KLRU family, ACL executive producer, Terry Lacona. Thank Judy. you for being with us this afternoon. Always a pleasure to come back to what used to be my home. I it know. It still feels like it in so many ways. So we're talking about iconic Austin, and there are a few things as iconic, in my mind, as Studio 6A. Uh, this is the home of Austin City Limits, the original Austin City Limits, right? It certainly is, and you know, it's even been declared a historic rock and roll landmark by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it's, you know, it's got a golden plaque outside the building to prove that. And it still is a place where so much history has yeah. happened over the years. So, so much incredible music has, has happened on that very stage that I can't help but get chills when I walk back in here. I really still feel that way. Um, I, I, I love working in this building because I feel the good karma that comes out. Before mm -hmm. we walk into 6A, one of the things I remember about coming to tapings here was the free beer. Oh, remember, yeah. I mean, so, so when we came in, it was People a small... People still complain that yeah. we don't have free beer anymore at the new shows down at the Moody, but uh, yeah. there's a little, little liquor license that gets in the yeah, way of, yeah, of, of course, like that. Of yes, that was a tradition going back to like almost day one, I think, when we had uh, Lone Star as our original sponsor for the show. And we would have tables set up here in the, in the lobby and have like dozens of cups of beer filled and ready and waiting for yeah. the, uh, the audience once they started coming in. I mean, those of us that were lucky enough to be in Austin a long time and come to shows here, I have so many wonderful memories. But let's go inside and show everybody because few people get a peek behind the scenes of this iconic studio. This is studio. true since we no longer do the shows here. That's right. So when did you guys move out of here? 2012. In fact, it's hard to believe we're coming up on our ninth season starting in just a few weeks since we moved out of Studio 6A. Yeah. Another the, indication of how time flies. But the car It's also is hard to believe there. this is our 45th year, Judy. <laughs> 45 years. Terry, I have to tell you that I ran into uh, Matthew McConaughey on the on the uh, elevator about a month ago, coming up to look look at the oh, studio, really? and I said, "Remember, don't mess with anything. There's good karma <laughs> in that in that studio." Okay, so this is studio under construction. Uh, there's some, some backdrops under construction. We, we they still use the studio thing. for other KLD yeah. productions, of course. We do our decibel show. Here there you here. go. So we're going to come in here. And um, how many, first of all, how many people fit in this Well, studio? when the show started back in 1974, when Willie did the original pilot, I think we had as many as six or 700 people in here. And uh, that continued for quite a few years, in so fact. So they sit on the floor? How, what was the arrangement? And the, what was the original arrangement of the studio? The original arrangement, we had uh, bleacher seating that went all around the stage, wrapped around the backside of the stage. Oh. Now, we did that for the first couple, two to three years, and then realized nobody really wanted to sit in the back and stare <laughs> at somebody's, <laughs> the back of somebody's head. Yeah. And also, seeing the audience on camera is, is a good thing most of the time. But you don't always want to see people scratching their head and picking their nose or looking <laughs> tired backstage. And occasionally you'd see somebody like that. So anyway, we came up with the idea of having the Austin skyline as the backdrop in our seventh season. And we still do. This is the original skyline. The new one, of course, I is remember the that downtown. One. <laughs> I remember we didn't we've have added, all the high rises. We've added a few more buildings to the skyline today. In fact, we probably should even update it again. But uh, what better backdrop than the Austin skyline for Austin city limits, you know? People always ask me, where do they film Austin? This is back in the day. Where do they film Austin city limits? Wh which park? Where is it outside? So they thought that was the, you know, people all over the country think that's the original, the and real you know, backdrop of Austin. Interestingly, in Studio 6A, it looks more real than it does down at the Moody Theater. Yeah. I guess because the Moody is so much yeah. bigger. But because of the scale, because of just the, the juxtaposition of the, the backdrop and the audience and the cameras, it really does seem like the real deal. And it's surprising how many people, I think, even to this day, um, really believed that it was outside. Yeah. We did a show a few years ago now, maybe, with Paul Simon, oh, first right. time he had ever been on ACL. And it was at the new mm -hmm. venue at the Moody. And I remember when he walked in for rehearsal and he kind of walked around to the front of the stage and he stood there like this. And I walked over to him to, to introduce myself. And the first thing he said was, you know, I always thought it was in a park. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, we even fooled Paul, Paul Simon, Simon and millions of other people. But it's a good thing it was not in a park outside or else we would have had a few rainy nights 
or very and hot ones. Or very hot or very cold, so yeah. here we have the perfect weather. I want some anecdotes, Terry. I want you to tell me about some of the people who have played on the stage, but let's start from the beginning. Why, why did they choose Willie? I know you had, hadn't quite come on board yet, but I guess Willie Nelson wasn't that famous in 74? I don't know. Well, he was and he wasn't. Willie, of course, is from Texas, but he had moved to Nashville, like just about every other person who wants to be a country music star does. And um, after a few years, he had a great reputation as a songwriter, not so much as a singer and a recording artist, but at some point he just got fed up with the Nashville machine and just decided to move back to Texas. The story goes was after his house burned down in Nashville, he said, all right, I've had it, I'm going home. And when he came home to Texas, the most logical place for him to move to was Austin because the music scene was really exploding in the early and mid 70s with groups like Asleep at the Wheel and people like Jerry Jeff Walker, Michael Martin Murphy and Marsha Ball. And you know, there were so many other great bands and artists um, who made up the Austin scene, the Armadillo World Headquarters. You know, it was, mm. it was maybe the golden age in so many ways of, uh, of, the, er, of the early music scene. And Austin scene. was affordable. And that's when the University of Texas built this communication school. And KLU designed this studio, among others, to do large scale productions. <coughs> now, KLRU, when they started, they had no idea that they might do a music show in this room. They thought they would do um, children's kids shows, kids, yeah. kids shows <laughs> right. um, ballet, uh, any number of possibilities. It's one reason why they have such a high ceiling in here to fly in set pieces. But with really? the Austin music scene exploding and with Willie Nelson moving to town, which did create quite a you know, quite a quite a fuss, you know, at the time because he was a big name in Texas, if yeah, not sure. in Nashville. And um, they had two people in mind to do a pilot show for this tentative music series. One was Willie, the other was B. W. Stevenson, okay. who was also one of the mm -hmm. you know more prominent Cosmic Texas Cowboy artists type, at the time. I guess. Yeah, exactly. So B. W. actually taped a show before Willie did. Now, this is one of those little known you know, footnotes. And, um, but they had a hard time getting an audience in. It wasn't really promoted very well. And the show didn't quite turn out the way that they had hoped, the, the original producers. And this was before my time. But, uh, so then they got Willie in here. Willie was certainly well known enough and generated enough excitement that they were able to fill up the room. And that original show with Willie was in October of 1974. And you know, we just did a new show with Willie a few months ago back in November. I'm thrilled to be there. And just talk about kind of getting goosebumps and, and seeing Willie step back out on stage. When he did this pilot show, he was 40 years old. He's going on 86 now. So he's still going strong. Austin City Limits, of course, is still going strong. And the two of us have had such a history together, you know, that uh, none Special of this would have been possible without him. And I think, you know, Willie has appeared on our show more than any other single artist. So I think we have probably contributed to his, you know, longevity and, and the fact that he is such a star. I want to go up on the set because I, I well, get excited. I, I get those goosebumps yeah. every time I go up on the set. But Blair, be careful. Photographers <laughs> walking backwards. Um, speaking this of This is not the original stage. I this saw was that built in some old pictures. I think we actually have some of them. Right. That was, course, was just a you know, kind of a set at the time, not intended to last for 40 years. <laughs> but so do you know stage, when this one came on board? Yes, my first year as producer, which was season four, so that would have been, say, 1977 or 78, was when this stage was built. And uh, it's a wood stage, it is solid. We had originally yeah. talked about maybe moving this down to the new venue, and we brought in some experts in movie set construction and that sort of thing to, to talk to about how we could physically move it. And they basically said, no, <laughs> you'll ruin it if you try to move this thing. This is like a rock. And uh, a lot of people have told me over the years, the feeling they get when they walk out on the stage being so solid. A lot of mm -hmm. stages are pretty flimsy, like at music mm -hmm. festivals, Did you know, you, you can kind of feel yourself it? bouncing up and down. Mm -hmm. This one has, has has earned some creaks over the years, you know, a sure sign of something that's, you know, getting a little along in time. But 
You know, you just stand here as many times as it's been painted, but you think about the people who have stood on this stage, who have poured their hearts out, played incredible guitar solos, um, been captured, you know, on, on video and carried to millions of people around the world to see. It's all happened right right here from this this spot. You can't stand here without getting that. I just got chills feeling. when you're talking. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely got a feel to it when you walk in, and it, it's uh, to me it's a little bit of warmth. You know, even though the the temperature's always cold, I, I feel all cozy and warm inside when I when I see this. There set. is a, a magic in this room, and people keep using that word over and over again. And it's not a cliche. It's it's true. Um, the fact that it's such an intimate space. The fact that the acoustics are pristine in here, the way the stage was built to come out into the audience so that people sort of wrap around the sides. And of course, we'd always have an audience either sitting on the floor or standing right in the front. And it's literally like a one step down from here yeah. to there. So that close. created yeah. that chemistry, which helped create that magic, mm -hmm. you know? I remember sitting at a little table, I guess probably in the 80s, and seeing Michael Martin Murphy and just thinking, I'm sitting right here. And I want to hear about some of your stories, though. Like, tell us about some of your favorite memories of shows here in 6A. One of the very first shows that I did in my first year as producer with, was with Tom Waits, which is still a classic show. He's never come back to do a new one. And we still repeat that show every year towards the end of the year. <coughs> um, and Tom Waits has always been a character back then, even today. And when he came in to, to do the show, to do the rehearsal in the afternoon, he kind of <coughs> wandered around on the stage and then disappeared. And it turns out he walked off to go find a couch and took a nap for like four hours. <laughs> <coughs> so I was wondering if we would even have a show that night. But of course we did, and it turned out to be one of those mm -hmm. legendary shows uh, that, that still stands out to this day. I think, you know, I've told this story many times, but getting Ray Charles in my second year as the producer to, uh, to do Austin City Limits was a huge, big step forward. To get somebody of his stature, you know, to do the show really gave us the, that kind of credibility that, that we yeah, didn't really have up, up until then. B.B. Um, King, uh, you know, Roy Orbison, mm. Stevie Ray Vaughan, People ask me what was my most favorite show or what one, what's the best Austin City Limits, which is a crazy yeah, it's question. Like you can't just. Your children, yeah. No. <laughs> but the show with Stevie Ray was, was really special in a personal and kind of an emotional way because it was the last TV that he had done, you know, before he died. And it was really just within a few months of when he died in that tragic uh, helicopter crash. So, and given his history with Austin and all, it was. It was such a powerful show. He was at the top of his game that, you know, one can't feel a special connection to that show and to him, of course. Um, there are some stories we can't tell, but, <laughs> you know, for the most part, in the old days when people came to do a show, do, to do a taping, um, it was almost like a party sort of mood. It was like, we're going to do TV, you know, let's have a good time. <laughs> And so they wouldn't hold back from indulging in whatever their you know, favorite thing was at the time. <laughs> and so you never knew what you were gonna get on camera when, when it was t uh, time for the show. Um, people have a different attitude about it now. I don't know at what point that changed, but now when an artist is invited to come and do Austin City Limits, it's like, whew, this is like a career milestone. It's a big deal. So people are on their best behavior, number one, but it just, it seems to bring out the best in people. You can pick any artist and no matter how good they are, he or she, um, when they do Austin City Limits, they know it's not just another late night TV show. Um, it's not something that's gonna, you know, be seen and forgotten within a few weeks or months. It's something for the ages, for posterity. And Did it truly is. Indeed it is. It's the, what the longest running Music As series. As I said, yeah, 45 yeah. years coming yeah. up, and it's the longest running music television show anywhere, you know, in history. Uh, we haven't found another one yet, you know, that has lasted as long and is still going, um, not just in the U.S. So, how 
how did it get to be that way? We scratch our heads sometimes and wonder, how is this possible? How is this, how is this happening? But you guys have all been together. Try not to together. think about it too hard, though. I mean, it's a family. The people that you started with, a lot of them are still here. It's true, and it sounds like a cliche, but in this case, it's not. I mean, there are people who've been working with uh, on the show longer than I have. Uh, David Huff, our audio director, mixed the original Willie Nelson pilot. Ray Lucero, our longtime stage manager, has been with the show since day one. He's retired from KLRU, but he still comes back, you know, to work with us on ACL. Uh, Michael Emery, among many other production Hi, people, Michael. Michael's here helping have us been uh, working today. with the show not just for years but decades. And um, you know, uh, nobody wants to leave. Nobody wants to to, to, to let go, myself included, because it'd be like leaving your own family. You know, mm -hmm. and who who would want to do that? And it's, you know, I got to give credit to everybody at KLRU. Um, the show wouldn't have survived if it wasn't for the, the support, not just the financial support, but the, you know, the emotional support and, and, and the true affection that the people at the station feel mm -hmm. for the show. Everybody at KLRU feels like they're a part of Austin, City, Austin City Limits. I don't care if you work in yeah. accounting or traffic mm -hmm. or engineer, any part of the station. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's maybe one of the most fun things to do, but it's also just great to feel connected to something that has such a history to it. Do you think that if you tried to start something like Austin City Limits in today's media climate that it would be possible? I've thought about that, and given the universe of television today, especially traditional television, I don't think so. Even within the world of public television, I think it'd be very difficult. Other music shows have come and gone. I mean, I could make a laundry list of the music shows that have kind of tried to imitate our style, at least in terms of the concert format. And they may have lasted a, you know, a few years or so and then sort of quietly just, just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, you got to remember that when ACL started in 1974, public broadcasting was, was really a new thing. Yeah, and it's I mean, President Johnson signed yeah. the Public Broadcasting Act in 1968. And Bill Arhos and, and others came up with the idea for ACL, you know, six years later. And most of the other shows from that era have, have also, you know, gone away or off the air, except for the obvious ones like Sesame Street. Um, but to do it today, and especially with the format that we have, People, there's a trust in Austin City Limits that would be really hard to create or duplicate in, in today's environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get away with anything. Anything goes. People ask me, what is our, our format and how do we decide what music to, to feature on the show? You know, it's all over the uh, music map. And the only criteria that I really apply when we book a show is originality. I'm not looking for somebody who's trying to copy whatever, whatever the latest trend is or to sound like somebody else. I'm looking for an act, an artist, or a band that has something unique to say through their music, whether it's their singing, their songwriting, their virtuosity on whatever instrument mm -hmm. or their arrangements, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is still plenty of great talent out there waiting to be discovered, waiting for their chance. To Not to be on this stage, yeah, to be on the but one to at be on the stage at the Moody. Um, right. I want to I look at the piano, if that's okay. Because, oh, yeah. And I want you to share some of the stories. <coughs> I, I, I've heard a lot about this piano, and, and it's, it's kind of funny because it, it really is a historic, it should play, have a place in music history because of all the mm -hmm. people who have played on it. But right now, it's backstage here. <laughs> it is, hidden away behind the bleachers, covered up with a bunch of stuff. I'm not even sure what. Yeah. And there is a bit of a mystery about the piano itself because it was here when I came around. And I think the story goes that it originally came from the UT Music Department. And how many years it had been there, who knows? So how old the piano is is, is still kind of a, of a mystery. It's definitely older than Austin City Limits. So that puts it at about 50 years plus. It's a baby grand, a Steinway. And anybody who's ever played this piano has loved the sound really? from, from, from this piano. <clears throat> it may not be that impressive. And, you know, obviously you've seen grand pianos that are 
much shinier and, mm -hmm. and, and, and newer. So who's played on this piano, yes, you who's might wonder. On the piano? Well, you know, everybody from Marsha Ball in the early days mm. to Ray Charles when he did the show. Wow. Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, um, Tom Waits, as I mentioned earlier. Just about anybody who plays piano has, you know, touched these keys. Now, there are some uh, pianists who bring their own pianos or have a specific brand that they prefer to play on, but I kind of feel sorry for those because they get they miss out on the chance yeah. to play something that has so much history behind it. And you know, it's it's a little weird to be honest that it is sitting here so inconspicuously kind of our, prop, our prop area kind behind of. the bleachers. We're pulling back the curtains literally. <laughs> <laughs> when some people have said it should be in the Smithsonian yes. Institute in Washington, D.C. or somewhere on display. Yeah. And, but, but part of me thinks it still deserves to be played yeah. somewhere, um, right. if not here. Uh, because like with any great instrument that has stood the test of time, and especially one with history behind it, you know, it should still be used. It sh should still be played. So can I? I don't know how we would go about doing that. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Well, <laughs> do you play the piano? No, you know, it's one of my uh, few regrets about what I do. Most of it is that so I don't, much. I don't, I don't play any musical instrument. I've never learned how to play. I should have. It's my own fault. Do you sing? <clears throat> no, not in public, at least. So, <laughs> so how did I mean, so you grew up in, what's in karaoke? Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm originally from Poughkeepsie, New York, upstate New York. It's about 75 miles north of New York City. And did you come to Austin for the music scene? Kind of for radio? Mostly, or just it was I a was cool in place? radio uh, back in, in New York. And um, frankly, I also hated the cold weather. And so growing up in upstate New York, you know, I got plenty of it. And uh, I had heard about the Austin music scene uh, from someone when I was doing my, my radio show. Someone called me who had gone to UT at the time and started talking about what a great place it was and the music was incredible and you should go check it out. So I had a musician friend of mine in Poughkeepsie and the two of us took a road trip down here in the summer and went to Willie, Willie's first, um, no, no, not his first. A picnic? I think it was his third 4th of July oh. picnic. Okay. So <laughs> I came here in the middle of July, in the middle of summer to see Willie's picnic and I had never experienced that kind of heat before in my life, but I still fell in love with it and decided to move here four months later and you know, I thought you I would never back. give it a try, and here I am. You know, yeah, literally, this is um, 45 years later yeah. uh, that I have that I've been here. Let's look and ahead. I may be the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do what I do yeah. in addition to the work that I do on the Grammys. And uh, you, you know, never stop. Very, I'm very proud and, and very honored to be able to do it. You know, it's a combination of of that. Do you think you'll do it? Much longer? I, I would love to continue to do it as long as it's still fun, mm -hmm. as long as I stay healthy and, you know, and that I continue to do a, a good job, I hope, when it comes to booking the talent. I really can't imagine what else that I would do. I'm sure I could find some other this things. It's a dream job. You know what I mean? It is. People tell me I have the best job in Austin or maybe the best job, period. Yeah. And uh, I can't deny it, you know. So it's still fun. And what makes it fun is the, is the music. The fact that, you know, my team and I get to discover all of this amazing music out there and to book shows and to bring people on our stage who have maybe never been seen or heard, you know, on national TV before. And uh, that's what people tell me who watch the show is that they love tuning in and may not have ever heard of fill in the blank before, but nine times out of 10, if it's good, they're, they're gonna like it because they know Austin City Limits has the reputation for del delivering quality. I won't ask you about things you can't tell us, but I know <laughs> you're booking season 45, so. As we speak. Anything you wanna reveal about it that you can reveal? <laughs> well, we hope to start taping by late February or early March. Our taping season is pretty broad. We typically will start in the uh, early months and mm -hmm. continue until uh, around November when mm -hmm. things start to quiet down for the holidays. And um, it's the usual mix of, uh, you know, whoever is hot out there right now or the, 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 the hippest, newest, coolest acts for, and, you know, who's representative of the Austin mm -hmm. scene in, in today's world. 
Um, I know there are a couple of iconic bands who uh, we have been chasing down for years, one of whom played at a recent ACL festival, who I'm trying to book for this year. And of course, um, Austin has its own share of amazing musicians, and there'll be a few of those in the lineup as well. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's always fun just to kind of see what's out there every year. But then it's tough to narrow it down to yeah, the, make the choices. 13 shows that we, we do. We could, we could fill up twice as many episodes oh, if, we had, you know, if we had that uh, luxury. Well, so. I, I am one of those longtime Austinites who still has a such a special I think I've seen you in place. a few audience shots over the years. I was here for Pearl Jam, and <laughs> I loved every minute. You know um, what's also funny is just to watch the old shows and see the audience shots. <laughs> yeah, the hair Because that tells you a lot, too, <laughs> yeah, about how right. times have changed, yeah. not just the music. And now you have ACL Radio. That's uh, right. Austin Steelers Radio, and uh, of course the festival's been since 2000, mm -hmm. I don't know, two maybe? <laughs> Something like that. Early, early aughts. <laughs> I'm losing so, track. I mean, the, just the brand has just expanded. I, I think you, you know can watch else? it on American Airlines. <coughs> I was just going to say, that has gotten more attention, I think, than anything we've done recently. Uh, the festival is, is incredible. ACL Radio is something new and exciting. But I have heard from so many people about them, you know, discovering Austin City Limits on an American Airlines <laughs> flight as part of their in-flight entertainment uh, package. Very cool. And including from artists and managers and, you know, important people in the business who fly a lot. And when they discover ACL, somebody just recently emailed me and said that they saw the Robert Plant episode on, a, on an American Airlines flight. So I think that's a very cool thing. Um, and yet, you know, we've been very discreet about what we have done and some things that we've passed on, like the idea of the Austin City Limits uh, Cafe and casinos across the South. It was something that just didn't seem like a good fit at the time. Mm -hmm. It's a precious so brand. You want, I'm sure you want to protect exactly. it. Mm -hmm. Do you have, as, as we close, do you have one anecdote that's maybe where something went wrong or Anything that you can share with the audience that they might not know about Austin City Limits? Well, there aren't too many stories that people haven't already heard if they've paid any attention or seen the documentary or read yeah. the multiple books about the show yeah. that have come out. But some of the people watching <coughs> maybe not have. Right, of course. Well, the most famous or infamous night that I can recall here in the studio was back when we did a show with Chris Christopherson in season eight. And literally, as I was getting on stage to introduce Chris, the lights went out in the studio. Uh, there was a power failure, basically. Oh, and the room was full of hundreds of people in total darkness. And that was also when we discovered there was no emergency lighting system <laughs> in the studio at the time. <laughs> well, you know, we expected the lights would come back on in, you know, a few seconds or minutes, but they actually didn't come back on until the next day. So we ended up having to lead people out the door once we found some flashlights out into the streets. It was a pouring, uh, th it was a thunderstorm raging outside at the time. Maybe that caused the blackout. Nobody knows for sure. And uh, long story short, Chris actually stayed around for another day, came back and did the show the next night. Oh, what a good guy. That, I shouldn't brag about this, but that's the only time we had to cancel the show. Let's find some on, on, wood. on such short notice. Yeah. Anything is possible. And after so many years, I guess we've had an incredible amount of luck, most of it due to the, you know, the hard work and commitment of the, the staff and also mm -hmm. the artists, you know, desire to come in and do the show. Um, you know, but um, there are just so many stories that they all kind of run together. Yeah, yeah. It seems well, like we one big blur. I know there are many stories yet to be told as well about Austin City Limits. I hope so and moving forward. We're excited about season 45. We're excited that you've been part of the KLRU family for so long and, and this show is, is an incredible gift from Austin to the world, really. So one of the few things about Austin that hasn't really changed yeah. in the last uh, 45 years. I mean, the show has evolved, of course, it looks different than it did back then, but the idea behind Austin City Limits, as pure and simple as it is, has endured the test of time. As much as Austin has grown and changed and with so many more people here, I think that's part of the reason people continue to move here is because of things like Austin City Limits. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry, for talking Thanks, with us. Judy, I know you're busy your interest, producing the Grammys right now and 
have a busy schedule flying back and forth, so we appreciate your time today. We Happy to do it, and looking forward to seeing you in the audience at many more shows to Yes, come. you bet I'll be there. And you too out there. That's so. right. We thank you guys for Go to our website watching. and find out when the tapings are, and the tickets are available first come, first served by a lottery system. But and there's no free beer. There's a good chance you'll get in, too, and there is no free beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in this afternoon. Make it a great weekend.